Oh, come on. If contraception is immoral, according to Catholic teaching, what's a couple supposed to do? Just have 15 kids? Dr. Christopher West here, Theology of the Body Guy. In this video, we're going to take a look. And you may be surprised at how insightful the church's vision here is. Hey, if you're new to this channel, we are all about demonstrating how our earthly bodies reveal divine, heavenly mysteries. If you want to dive deeply into questions about what it means to be human and crawl out of the confusion in this modern world that has eclipsed the meaning of being male and female, you're going to want to subscribe to this channel. Click like, click the notification bell, leave a comment, share these videos. All of that compels YouTube's algorithm to help get this good news out to the world. We continue the series looking at questions from my book, Good News About Sex and Marriage. If you'd like your own copy to follow along, check out the link below. We're on page 100 and we're asking the question, if contraception is immoral, what the heck is a couple supposed to do? Just have 15 kids? Suppose there's a couple who has internalized what it means that sexual intercourse is meant to be an expression and renewal of their wedding vows, right? If you haven't seen other videos on this channel, check out the video here where I talk about sex being an expression and renewal of wedding vows. Now suppose this couple, they understand this, they want to live this, and they never want to violate their vows, as every married couple should want to never violate their vows. Suppose they also have a just reason to space their children or not to have another baby at all. In a future video, we'll talk about what just reasons for spacing or avoiding children indefinitely might be. What could that couple, they want to renew their wedding vows, they understand contraception, turns the I do into an I do not, but they have a serious reason to avoid a child. What could they do that would not violate their wedding vows? And I'll bet you a million bucks that you're doing it right now. What are you doing right now? Bet you a million bucks right now you're abstaining from sex. <laughs> we abstain from sex all the time, right? We're abstaining from sex right now. At least, I sure as heck hope you're abstaining from sex right now. That would be very unusual if you were watching this video while you were having sex. Weird. Why did I even say that on the video? I don't know. Let's keep going. <laughs> Every married couple knows that abstaining from sex can be a profound act of love. In fact, many, many times in married life, there are occasions where you might want to renew your wedding vows through intercourse, but you have a serious reason to abstain. And in fact, love demands that you abstain. Maybe one of you is sick. Maybe you are at the in-laws and there are thin walls. Maybe you're in a public place. If you can't abstain in these situations, your love, in fact, is called into question and maybe you have a serious reason to avoid a pregnancy. If you can't abstain in those situations, your love is called into question. Human dignity and the meaning of sexual intercourse reveal that the only acceptable form of birth control is self-control. Think about it. Why do we spay or neuter our dogs and cats? Why don't we just ask them to abstain? Well, because they're ruled by instinct and can't abstain. When we spay or neuter ourselves, so to speak, with contraception, we're reducing the free, total, faithful, fruitful gift of self that is meant to be the sacramental sign of the marriage bond. We're reducing that to the level of fido and fidet in heat. The point is this, we are not animals. We are persons made in the image and likeness of God, and we have freedom, or at least we should have the freedom to say yes or to say no. If we cannot say no to our urge to merge, we're not free, and we can't be a gift. John Paul II and the whole teaching of the Catholic Church is calling all of us to the freedom for which Christ has set us free. And that freedom is being exercised when a couple 
chooses to abstain in order to honor the integrity of what sexual intercourse is meant to say, when they abstain to honor that, that is a profound act of love. But then the objection arises. What are you saying, Christopher, that a couple has a serious reason to avoid children would have to abstain until the wife hits menopause? Well, yeah, what's the problem? Suck it up. <laughs> Actually, let's look at the couple past childbearing years. They know that if they engage in an act of intercourse, it's not going to result in a child, right? Are they contracepting? Why did it not result in a child? It didn't result in a child because God didn't want it to result in a child as evidenced by the very way he made a woman's body. Well, guess what? Even during a woman's fertile years, by the very design, the very way God has made a woman's body, it becomes clear that God does not desire that each and every act of intercourse result in a child. M my goodness, if that were the case, couples would have hundreds, thousands of children. <laughs> no, even during a woman's fertile years, for about two-thirds of every month, the woman is naturally infertile. That's the way God made it. Let's return now to the couple who's determined never to violate their wedding vows. They understand to render the sexual act sterile turns the I do into an I do not. Out of respect for the meaning of sex, they abstain from intercourse because they have serious reason to avoid a pregnancy when the woman's fertile. They abstain. Now let's suppose that on a given day of the wife's cycle, they're able to determine that she's not fertile. They have intercourse. Pregnancy does not result. Have they contracepted? Have they violated God's intention for that union? Not in the least. They have opened themselves and accepted exactly the way God made the woman. This is the very principle behind the church's teaching that accepts natural family planning, but recognizes that in each and every case, the use of contraception is immoral. And let me also add that with modern methods of natural family planning, not to be confused with your grandmother or great-grandmother's rhythm method, Modern methods of natural family planning, when you're properly trained to use them, are 98 to 99 percent effective in determining when a woman is fertile and when a woman is infertile. But understandable objections arise. People say, oh, come on. That's splitting hairs. What is the big difference between sterilizing the act of intercourse and just waiting till it's naturally infertile? Both couples avoid children. The end result is the very same thing. To which I respond, Oh, come on. What is the big difference between killing grandma and just waiting till she dies naturally? The end result is the same thing, dead grandma. Yes, end result is the same thing, but let me point out a very significant difference. In one, grandma's dead, but it's an act of murder, a serious sin. In the other, grandma is also dead, but there's no sin involved whatsoever because her death is an act of God. My brothers and sisters, I want you to think about this long and hard. If you can tell the difference between youth in Asia and youth in Africa, but I, psh, <laughs> Stupid jokes aside, if you can tell the moral difference between euthanasia and natural death, you can tell the moral difference between contraception and natural family planning. They're the same difference. I'm not saying contraception is an act of murder. Rather, the analogy is this. In both situations, natural death, natural infertility, God remains God. Whereas in both situations, euthanasia and contraception we are taking the powers of life into our own hands and making ourselves like God. Wasn't that the original sin, to make ourselves like God? As John Paul II once said, contraception is to be judged so profoundly unlawful as never to be for any reason justified. To think or to say the contrary is equal to maintaining that in human life, Situations may arise in which it is lawful not to recognize God as God. Dear God, help us to recognize you as God. 
as Lord of our lives, as Lord of our fertility. Forgive us for the ways we take the powers of life into our own hands and try to make ourselves like you. Lord, you've already made us like you. Fertility itself reveals that we are made in your image and likeness, that we are called to live as signs of your own life-giving love. Forgive us for the ways we have not lived this. Give us the grace to live this as we are really called to live this. Open our eyes, Lord, to who we really are. My brothers and sisters, I have so much more to share with you. Do not despair if you have not lived this. There is no better time than the present for the conversion of our hearts. Check out the links below to learn more about ongoing formation as part of our patron community and to learn about the courses that I teach online and in person through the Theology of the Body Institute. Till next time, may our eyes be opened all the more to the truth that our bodies tell a divine story.